Hello, friends. I'm Kathy Fay, Executive Director of the Boston Early Music Festival, or BEMF, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to this very special pre-concert talk preparatory to the second performance of our 2021 season, themed Together Again, and featuring the extraordinary Renaissance band Pifero. It is my honor to introduce our guests, the esteemed artistic co-directors of Pifero, Joan Kimball, Robert Weimkin, and our veteran Banff Orchestra Baroque bassoon player, Dominic Teresi. Welcome, Joan, Bob, and Dominic. Thank you, Kathy. Joan Thank is you so much for oh, having us. You're so welcome. As the current season marks Pifero's final season with the two of you at the helm, please know that all of us at Banff are particularly pleased to honor your remarkable leadership and your extraordinary accomplishments over the last 40 years with your upcoming Sunday, November 14th performance on the BEMF stage. Of course, the entire early music community will miss you both dearly, but we're looking forward to the continuing success of Pifero under the leadership of Priscilla Harried beginning next season. Before I turn the microphone over to Dominique, our moderator, for those wishing to attend our Sunday, November 14th performance by Pifero, we're sold out of in-person tickets meaning only virtual tickets are now available. Please visit the BEMF website at BEMF.org to order your virtual ticket. At only $15 per household, this is a performance you simply cannot afford to miss. The concert video will be available from Friday, November 26th through Thursday, December 9th. And again, for just $15, every member of your household can enjoy this video as many times as, you, as you'd like. So with that, I will now disappear from the screen and turn the discussion over to th the three of you. And my thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, Bob and Joan. It is so great to see you. Great to see you, Dominic. Yes. yes. So yeah. nice to see you in your face, not yeah. just a, a voice on the, <laughs> in the ether. Yes, it, it's been it's been a while, obviously, but I'm 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 very happy that I get to sit here and talk with you a, a little bit about this amazing program that you guys will be presenting in Boston. Um, so the the title of this or the subtitle of your program is Fuging in Renaissance Music. And uh, fugue is not usually a word we um, we associate with Renaissance music, more with the works of Bach and his contemporaries. Can you guys tell us a little bit about uh, what this word fugue means in a Renaissance context? Uh, ab oh, absolutely, Dominic. And, and that's probably the best question you could start with since <laughs> it is uh, it was the, the point of this concert, uh, the whole concept to raise that question, what does fuguing mean? Um, and, and that's a very broad, the, the answer to that is very broad. Um, as early as the middle of the 15th century, we have composers titling their works Fugue, uh, Fuga ad quatquor by uh, Johannes Martini in the middle of the 15th century. Uh, we don't go quite that far back to the beginning, in the beginning of our show. Rather, we start with a, a wonderful piece by Jakob Obrecht entitled simply Fuga. And um, I think it's helpful to think about this term not so much in the relationship to what we think of as the formal fugal structure from, as you mentioned, Bach and other Baroque composers. Uh, that's the end of the journey uh, that we've, we're going to be traveling. The, the beginning starts with the, uh, basically with the word itself and that can mean many many things uh, when you when you follow the definition of the term the, the the latin term can mean to flee or to chase and in certain contexts the fleeing and the chasing idea is very prescriptive i think of what's going on uh, obrecht uh, akagem in the middle of the 15th century introduces us to imitative polyphony in which every voice has similar melo melodic material. That can mean canon, can mean canon exactly the same material, or simply imitation created in a way that reflects the melody that is the structure of the work. Uh, and so all of that is fugue. 
in the sense that it is counterpoint. That is, uh, that is the interaction of multiple voices together uh, in a way that, well, for instance, there are no viola parts in this music. <laughs> every, every part is of consequence and every part has melody. And it is really all about melody. Melody creates the structure that we think of as fugal in the late medieval and throughout the Renaissance, early Baroque periods. Uh, that's that's the short answer. <laughs> Maybe too long. <laughs> oh, that's really that's that's great. Um, so I am following on that. This this program it has such a huge scope um, of. Uh, of repertoire, you've got pieces as far back as the 11th century, or at least one piece anyway, and then you end up all the way with Bach on the other end. And can you tell us about how you researched the what the the repertoire that that uh, that you that fit into this program? It's such a uh, like you were saying, it's such a broad category of, of thought. And how did you narrow it to and choose what you wanted to present? Hmm. The, the, the notion of melody rides right there with that 11th century uh, hymn tune, the Christus der Standen. Uh, that melody then generates a whole history of polyphonic compositions in various counterpoint, various fugal relationships. And that's, that's one, of the, one of the musical journeys we try to take people through in this concert. So we start with the melody as it was written originally, and then follow the progression of how various composers treated that melody in counterpoint, uh, uh, fugally in uh, the broad definition of the term. That is, it could be, it could be very imitative. It could be simply the melody with two voices decorating the melody on top and and uh, below, uh, reflecting some of it. It may be. Uh, actually very clear imitation so that you hear portions of the melody in every single voice part. So this, uh, that was one, uh, one notion. The other notion is just uh, how broad the reflection of counterpoint um, appears in Renaissance composition uh, in so many different ways in so many different repertoires. For instance, the canzona uh, is one that I think most people who enjoy early music will be familiar with. Uh, and there we see the imitation, the chasing, and the fleeing of fugal writing very clearly uh, in, uh, for instance, the uh, canzona La Borga uh, that is played on recorders in this concert. Another, another journey that we take is with the uh, actually, fourth century <laughs> melody, the Asolis Ortus, uh, written um, yeah, written uh, in a in, well, it's it's an abecedarius. That is, there are twenty three verses to this piece. Each verse starts with a different letter of the alphabet, wow. and uh, that too, uh, we follow from the beginning of the melody through all of its renditions. Uh, either in the Catholic or in the Lutheran uh, traditions, all the way to Bach himself. Uh, and there, there are dance tunes too, but there is counterpoint and, uh, in the dance tunes in a fugal way, but not a strict canonic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this, uh, the idea of, of tracing these, these tunes that we may be more familiar with from, from Bach uh, you know, the Christus der Standen and the Asolis Ortus, and, but then really realizing how far back they reach and this, this, um, this tradition that, that, were, that Bach was part of and, you know, and, and probably had some awareness of, you know, uh, of, of the, the, the reach and how far back the tradition that he was going. Are, mm -hmm. I, you've chosen these two, um, pieces to, to highlight here? Are, would you say that there are a lot of examples that you can trace from the late medieval time all the way up to the Baroque like this with the un, unbroken thread? I think you can, yes. I think that, the, and we have, we've experimented that um, with those kinds of tunes in other programs as well. Although these remain two of our favorites 
Um, and so that's why we chose them for this particular concert. I think that that's, it's a fairly common thing to find a, find a hymn tune that one sees later in the 18th century and be able to follow it back at least three centuries. Mm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, most of this music on this program and actually all Pitfro programs is really, uh, was originally intended for voices. And of course you're playing everything on instruments. So, um, and in, uh, you know, before the 17th century and really the, even, you know, really the 18th century, uh, instrument, specific instrumentation was not really uh, a thing that composers um, handed down over to us so much. How do you go about choosing which instruments to use for all of these different pieces? Because you can have so many different co interesting, amazing combinations, sometimes in consort, sometimes broken up. And um, how do you go about deciding what to do? Well, that's, that, yeah, that's a fascinating uh, question too. Um, I would probably say that after 40 years, we have a good inclination <laughs> of what a piece looks like and what it's going to sound best on. Um, it's programmatic uh, concerns probably are in the forefront of making these decisions, but, but we also um, try to think about the, uh, the, the voice parts, the, the tessitura of the various uh, parts and uh, where, what sound we hear in our heads when we look at this piece. Uh, and, and then uh, thinking about the variety of the program and how we want to construct the story of the program instrumentally is also a, a, a concern that helps us to make those decisions. Joan, any thoughts? Right, and it, and it isn't as if we're, we're wedded to one particular kind of instrumentation on a piece, and we've been known to take a set or a group of pieces and, and try them on, for example, one, one time on recorders and another time on our um, brass and reed combination. So nothing is set in stone, but I think it's when you raise the point about the, uh, about the fact that this is mostly vocal music um, that we're playing on instruments and that we do have the the uh, latitude to decide on whatever we want to for our instrumentation because nothing was indicated. But I think it's important to remember too that our, our um, instrumental ancestors, the, the wind bands of the 15th and 16th and early 17th centuries were um, felt very free to, to use, uh, to take vocal repertoire and make it their own. We have examples of that, for example, some, some um, manuscripts that survived that were copied out for the wind bands that have, uh, that certainly are sacred and sometimes secular pieces. So this mm -hmm. is another thing that, that that we look at and why we have in cho choose so much vocal music. Yeah, like in particular, the you're thinking of maybe of the Regensburg. Uh, Regensburg manuscripts, the, Regensburg the, Lerma, and the Lerma manuscript. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh -huh. absolutely. Yeah. I suppose also some of it has to do with um, um, pacing yourselves through the program and you not doing uh, 15 Sham pieces in a row, you know, and needing, a, needing some <laughs> right. recorders to, to break that up, to give the chops mm -hmm. a break, yeah? And I think it's, it's not only us, but I think it's also the audience that mm -hmm. um, a, a steady a diet of Shams um, might be a bit much for, for some people and to have a little bit of a variety with, with the softer instruments, the recorders and something with lute um, certainly is a, provides the kind of variety that, that people enjoy in our concerts. Mm -hmm. mm, great. Um, now, Bob and John, you, you've been the artistic directors of Pifro for uh, in the neighborhood of 40 years. And, um, and over that time you've become really two of the most important figures in North American early music scene. And um, now that this is your, your last year, your last your final year with, with um, as leaders of PIFRO, and um, as you're looking back over the past four decades, what have, what have been some of the highlights of your tenure and, and this, this time you've had? Wow. <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, and one thing that jumps to mind for me, uh, especially, is the the wealth of colleagues that I've been able to work with as we've brought in guest artists, guest ensembles, to uh, to combine in and our shows. Um, we've recently put together lists of 
these, and it just goes on and on and on. And it's just wonderful that we've had these experiences, learn from these people, especially early on in our in, in our career, but also it just enjoyed putting together high quality music making with with so many wonderful people. And the collegiality that we've had, and, and knowing people in the in the field across the country, and even in Europe, we've had some um, amazing. Uh, times with uh, a group called Capilla Flamenca, a, a vocal ensemble of four men um, in the past. And uh, sadly, they are no more because their director died a number of years ago. But that was a that was a pivotal experience for us, going to Europe, going to Belgium and working with them, recording with them and learning so much about um, early polyphony from them as we listened to their singing and played along with them. Mm. I think another one really important for me has been the, the instrument journey. When we started in the early 80s, uh, we were playing on a ragtag motley crew of instruments that uh, it's a wonder that, <laughs> that people came back to hear them. But <laughs> it's been fascinating to work with instrument makers and uh, develop new forms. I think we've probably gone through uh, revived our instrumentarium at least four times, you know, in the course of the years. Uh, and the instruments that we're playing on now are just miles and miles away from the ones that we started with. And so we're leaving that legacy of, of sending <laughs> these instruments into the future loud bands uh, so that they, they can make the kind of music that, uh, that they need to be and want to be making. So that, that's been a, a really fascinating and, uh, uh, very uh, something that I appreciate of the, of the year's work. Yeah, do you feel like the the, the state of uh, instrument making now is sort of reached um, a a high point where these 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 instruments won't sort of become obsolete or uh, or um, and a decade from now, you know, like the ones you played in the '80s, where the, the, those ones now have have a more 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 future in them, to so to speak. Is that I think true? That's true. I think that's mm -hmm. true. Although I don't, I don't think the the period of experimentation is over. I think there will be no. new discoveries of instruments. There will be copies made of instruments in in museums and collections in Europe. That, um, in fact, we are uh, are. Our successor, uh, Priscilla, Priscilla Herod, is looking at some of the shams, for example, the early 17th century shams that we haven't had up to this point. Mm. And she's looking at, at possibly uh, using those for PFROs. So I would hope that it is not a static field, that, that um, instrument makers will continue to, to work and to, and to perfect what they have and to look at future possibilities. Are there any? One. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I no, was just going to say one other really uh, fascinating thing about as you say, the perdurability of these instruments is the current crop is that we've commissioned new works for them. And so in a sense, and we just premiered uh, a work uh, for Pifaro and uh, a group of six singers, variant six, from Kyle Smith based on the Ave Maristella hymn tune. And uh, <clears throat> so they have, in a sense, become modern instruments. That is, they are contemporary instruments. Their sounds have become contemporary. and work together in such a way that I think that they will have a life of their own. Uh, uh, I think there's work to do for sure, as Joan said, the, the quality, the variety, uh, refinements that we could, that we can add to them. And, and Joan and I will continue to work with people after we retire the directorship to continue this efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you play so many different instruments. I, mean, I think your collection must be so large. I wonder, are there anything? Are there any instruments out there that have stood the test of time? That is there any anything that you've that that you've you've had virtually since the the early days that that you still go back to and and enjoy playing? Oh, absolutely, and I can point to one of my uh, sets of many bagpipes that I own and play. Uh, there's one set that was our original, um, made by Joel Robinson, who was a founding member with me um, back in the early 80s uh, of the ensemble. And uh, that, that instrument still carries on and uh, plays itself. And we play it in many of the concerts uh, that we do. You will hear, no, you won't hear that one in Boston, but uh, yes, that one is definitely one that has been with me for many a year. <laughs> That's great. And um, so what are you, 
now, or what are each of you looking forward to in, in this new life that you'll have this uh, <laughs> post Pifero? You, you, I imagine that leading this group has been sort of all encompassing for the, the last decades. And uh, how does that make you feel knowing that um, all these things that you've been, you've, you, all the, the pressures and, and responsibilities of, of leadership um, are being passed on. Well, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the support that uh, we've gotten from our board, from, uh, from many people uh, to continue P4O. One of the thoughts was, well, let's just end P4O, have a big party and say it was a great run. But we felt that uh, the work that we put in needs to needs to continue in one form or another, and if it can be Pifero continuing, then uh, that's fabulous. Uh, as far as myself, um, I'm not going to stop making reads for people. I think there are quite a few people out there who still need reads, and yes, and, I know some uh, of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I need a protege to take over that business, but uh, so we'll both be making reads. We'll both continue to teach, uh, both privately and uh, probably at workshops here and there and uh, elsewhere. Uh, but uh, there are other things that we'd like to pursue in life. Um, and I think the, we'd like to leave P4O while we're still playing at a peak level and not to, <laughs> not uh, have people wishing that, well, I think Bob and Joan should, should step off the stage <laughs> at some point. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I agree, yeah. And I think that for us too, that the, you know, after, after decades, as you say, of the, of the pressures of, of both doing a lot of administrative work and artistic work and playing in the ensemble and directing in rehearsals, it, it's been a lot of work. And I think we're happy to take um, step away from that too, that, that, that kind of pressure. And not that we're going to, as Bob said, not that we're going to stop doing things and we'll still be, still be active, but I, but it does seem that it's, it's time to, for us, maybe not to have to just live under quite so much stress as one does when one runs an organization. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, well, it's been such a wonderful pleasure talking to you both and, um, I'm very much looking forward to the, hearing this program. I I have heard some of this music and played some of it, Bob, be, because uh, yes. you've uh, brought a few of these things up to um, up to play with the Juilliard students and before in the before days, as they say. And uh, <laughs> right. And uh, I look forward to um, the next time we get to do that together again mm -hmm. as well. Um, so. And uh, it was very wonderful talking to you both. And I really look forward to the concert. Well, great. thank you, Dominic. I really yes. appreciate being here. Right. And thank you for great questions. And it was fun to have this conversation. Yes. yes. Let's do it in person again. Yes. <laughs>